from the United Nations headquarters in New York. This is Disarmament Today. After three years in the making, on November 18th, 2022, states, international organizations and civil society came together in Dublin, Ireland to officially endorse and support the political declaration on strengthening the protection of civilians from the humanitarian consequences arising from the use of explosive weapons in populated areas, also known as the political declaration on IWIPA. My name is Juliana, and I work for the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs in Geneva, and I have brought together a few people that will be walking us through what this declaration is, what the problem is that it responds to, and why it is such an important achievement. First, I want to turn to Melanie Regimbal, Chief of Service of the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs in Geneva, who will help us better understand what it is that we're actually talking about. Melanie, maybe you can start by telling us what explosive weapons are. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Explosive weapons are a subset of what is referred to as conventional weapons and are being used by national military forces and non-state armed groups. But generally, these weapons create a blast and fragmentation zone that makes their use highly consequential for civilian well-being and infrastructure, particularly if used in populated areas. So these types of weapons are not necessarily new. Why is their use a problem? These weapons were originally designed for use in open battlefield, but when used in populated areas, the, they're often indiscriminate because of the large destruction radius, the inaccuracy of the system, and the delivery of multiple munitions over a wide area. When explosive weapons are used in populated areas, 90% of the victims are civilians. It's also important to note that civilian suffering, which includes death and injury, is not the end all and the be all. The reverberating effects of the use of explosive weapons in populated areas can cause long lasting harm and psychological trauma to victims with high levels of explosive ordnance con contamination, which will continue to kill and injure civilians years after the fighting has stopped. They also hamper reconstruction efforts and thus having a direct negative impact towards achieving sustainable development. And it denies individual their full enjoyment of their human rights. And what has the response of the international community been? Well, for over 10 years, the United Nations Secretary General has used his voice in good offices to express serious concerns over the humanitarian impact of the use of explosive weapons in populated areas and continues to call on member states and all parties to conflict to avoid using explosive weapons in populated areas and to ultimately take combat out of urban areas altogether. It is crucial that states come together and reaffirm their commitment to observing international law and strengthen their commitment to abiding by international humanitarian law. This is what makes an achievement like this declaration all the more important and significant. The declaration is a result of truly collective efforts of states, the ICRC, the United Nations system, and civil society. It's an important contribution to the international rules-based order and a milestone for efforts to advance humanitarian disarmament and curb human suffering during armed conflict. It also sets international standards for restricting and refraining from the use of explosive weapons and commits states to reviewing and adapting their military policies and practices. But perhaps most importantly, it sends a clear message that using explosive weapons in populated areas causes unacceptable civilian suffering and devastation that must stop. If and when fully effectively implemented, the declaration has the potential to significantly strengthen the protection of civilians from the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. Thank you, Melanie. So next with me, I have Ambassador Noel White, who is the permanent representative of Ireland to the UN in Geneva. Ambassador, thanks for joining me here today. 
Um, my first question to you would be, why a political declaration? And maybe you can also tell us a little bit about Ireland's role in this process and why it was important for Ireland to take on a process that would address the humanitarian harm arising from the use of the WIPA. Thank you, Julianne, and thanks for, for asking me to be uh, to take part in the podcast. Uh, it's very good to be here today. I suppose the, 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 the simple, straight-up answer to why a political declaration is because we were asked, and the Secretary General asked, asked the international community, uh, successive Secretary Generals, uh, to bring forward um, a political declaration through multilateral negotiations. Um, and we were responding, like others, were responding um, uh, to that to that call. The international community uh, needs needs and needed um, a structure through which to address this um, this issue of of great concern, um, which we can see is a problem is, is a problem all around us, and it's a current problem. And you need only look at Sudan, you need look at, at Kiev. Um, these are this, these are very real issues. So a political declaration provided a structure through which the international community could address this issue. Secretary Generals successively had asked for it, and we were responding to that, as, as were others. To answer the other part um, of your question, this is something that appealed to us because also it, it fits uh, very well um, with our overall policy posture in terms of support for um, disarmament in general. Um, it has always been a part of our foreign policy uh, since the founding of the state. Uh, it's something we've identified with and, and, and are identified by. Um, specifically, um, when we talk about the kind of difficulties or challenges that we're looking at now, um, we're looking at the increased urbanization uh, of conflicts. And there is a need and there's, a, there's consensus around this to address the humanitarian impact of a WIPA. Um, this is something that has emerged as a concern um, for quite a number of states and obviously across the United Nations. And we're, we're hearing this, of course, from the um, International Committee of the Red Cross. So it, it was time to sit up, take notice uh, and address the issue. And we saw an opening to do that and to make a contribution um, towards that. Um, just to give a little bit more context in terms of our own approach overall on disarmament, we have been instrumental in the establishment um, of a number of key disarmament uh, instruments, including the Anti-Personnel Landmine Convention and, of course, the Convention on Cluster Munitions. So whilst WIPA as such is, is distinct in, insofar as it's not a legally binding prohibition on any individual weapon type, um, it shares much of the um, core objective of reducing civilian suffering. Absolutely. And... In all of this, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how this process developed, kind of where did it start, where did it end, what happened along the way, mm -hmm. and uh, what was the actual agreement in the end? No, I'm delighted you asked me that question because um, we were being asked and identified a lot around this because the declaration culminated uh, in, in Dublin, and we're very pleased uh, about that. We're very pleased to be able to deliver it, and we, we, you know, we, we take certain pride in that, to be honest, um, and we want to see this continue to be a success. Um, but like a lot of these things, um, uh, these, these initiatives, um, there are many other people involved in it as well. We, we stand on the soldier of, on, on the shoulders of, of giants, or as others have said, um, this was like a, a game of rugby to put it in Irish context, um, if you will. Uh, and the ball was passed around and we took it over the line and, and managed to, to touch it down to score the try. Uh, but that's a collective effort and we situated ourselves at the, at the end of that process and we're happy to be able to, to do that. To go back a little bit to the start and to describe the process that, that you, you asked about, the roots of the, of the uh, political declaration um, are to be found in, in fact, in two UN General Assembly First Committee joint statements in 2018 and 2019, to be precise. <laughs> um, Ireland led the negotiations on those texts to help um, raise awareness at the time of these, and as well also to gauge um, the level of support that there would be for a declaration. It's important to know that there's a market and, 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 and then to try and harness that, um, uh, that, that, that sentiment. Um, but without going blow by blow through who said what to whom over the years, just to give you the, the, the sort of broad highlights of this, uh, back in 2019, um, the Secretary General and the President of the Red Cross uh, issued a high-level joint appeal which called on all states and parties to arm conflict to, and I quote, avoid the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. Uh, 
uh, with wide area effects. And that was a catalyst for bringing quite an amount of support and political and public attention to the issue. Um, I think it's important to recall in that respect as well that um, the kind of, I mentioned this at the outset, the, the amount of work that went on before you get to the point of Dublin uh, in November 2022, um, you have regional meetings in Maputo in 2017, Santiago in 2018, um, Germany as well led the so-called AWIPA talks, series of talks, um, and was following international conference um, attended by 133 states in Vienna in September 2019. We immediately, we stepped in at that point and we, we launched the negotiations um, in Geneva. What are we trying to do? Our objective was to initiate um, an inclusive and a transparent dialogue, of course, uh, through which we could collectively find agreement around a political declaration on explosive weapons in a nutshell. Um, so all of that to say the text is the result, it's the outcome of a long process initiated over three years ago. Um, the timelines, uh, as we always see in conversations like this, like, like this nowadays, the timelines are affected by COVID and um, we had to work around that. But we were able, uh, through our own efforts and through the efforts of uh, our colleagues here in Geneva, our partners in Geneva, uh, we were able to keep the momentum alive through a series of in-person, virtual, or combination of in-person, virtual, and written consultations, as well as the inevitable online webinars uh, <laughs> and the ongoing bilateral meetings with which you'll be, will be, will, you'll be familiar. Um, final negotiations here in Geneva in June 2022, just to recall, um, and the text eventually adopted then in Dublin in November 2022 by 83 states. We're very pleased to see 83 states. If I suspect you'd ask me about this, uh, we don't stop there. Uh, this is a process. So we are proud of the result. Um, and we think that um, it is a framework which can ultimately have an important impact um, in terms of the protection um, of civilians and address um, the uh, appalling situations that we're now witnessing around the world. And it is important to link them back and to link the declaration back uh, to the uh, the realities of what's happening on the ground and the organization of conflicts and um, people who are being displaced, who are not combatants, uh, who are simply suffering directly uh, as a result of conflicts because uh, of conflicts because urban areas are being are being targeted. Uh, it's not acceptable. It needs to be addressed. This is one element of that. Absolutely. And uh, I can just second what you said, that it is an achievement to be proud of. And uh, I think this is what is transcending from everyone that I have spoken to uh, for this podcast and outside of it. Um, so, of course, this, as we know, is a political declaration. So I guess my question to you, Ambassador, would be, what would you reply to the cynics, the ones that say, well, it's a political declaration. It's not the same as legally binding instrument. What's the worth of it? It's very easy to be cynical about this. It's very easy to be cynical about political declarations, um, resolutions. Um, I, I, I think there comes a certain point when we have to park our cynicism um, and, and and look at uh, look at what we're really addressing here. I I I have personally I happen to believe in the power of politics. Um, I think politics brings us, it brings us together. And even if we are disagreeing, it brings us together around our disagreements and allows us to, to move forward and progress. Um, it's true that the text does not establish um, a legal uh, prohibition on the use of any specific weapon. It is not a legal text. It's a political declaration. That's what it says on the tin. It's a political declaration. Prior to the political declaration, there wasn't one. And now there is. So now there is a structure through which we can address this issue. We can bring other countries on board, hopefully beyond the 83. Um, and we can path or map out a way forward for addressing this very real um, uh, issue. Um, but there are, beyond the mere aspirational, there are concrete elements to this political declaration. Um, first of all, the text it recognizes the humanitarian issues that are associated with WEEP, and that's important. To set it down, you have 83 countries, you have the uh, uh, wrapped around with the UN and the ICRC, and all the international multilateral credibility that you could possibly hope for is there. Stating clearly, yes, this is the humanitarian issue, this is what, so we were agreed on the problem, this is the, uh, the issue that we need uh, to address. We acknowledge that there's a problem to be addressed and that's not to be minimized, it's important. Um, and we set out within that 
um, a series of clear, forward-looking actions to address those issues. So now we're organized, we're together, we've identified the problem, and we have outlined, and it's not set down in hard, concrete terms, but outlined where we take this forward uh, and how we take it forward. So you might ask, yeah, but it's all aspirational guff. And what are you going to do with this? And these are people in smoke-filled rooms and it doesn't mean anything. But in fact, there are a series of practical measures uh, within this um, for all parties to armed conflict uh, to, 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 to address. And these range from a commitment to strengthen international cooperation and assistance on identification, development, exchange of good practices, uh, all around enhancing the um, protection of civilians, including crucially uh, in the whole area of data collection, um, which allows us to identify more concretely where the problems are and help go, go, about, go about addressing them. Um, crucially, I think it's important to recall that the text calls for the adoption and the implementation of a range of policies and practices to help avoid civilian harm, which is what we're about, um, including by restricting or refraining as much as, 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 as appropriate rather from the use of explosive weapons when their use could be expected to cause harm uh, to civilians or civilian, um, civilian objects. Um, these are the the, the pillars, the reference points around armed conflict, and those pillars and reference points exist, and it's important to remember that they exist, and they exist in the doctrines uh, of uh, of warfare, essentially, essentially, um, and this is part of that that overall body of work. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Thank you again, very kind. Moving to our next speaker, I want to start by, first of all, underlining the crucial work done by civil society, and in particular, the International Network on Explosive Weapons, also known as INU, which has been at the forefront of advocacy for immediate action to prevent human suffering resulting from the use of a weeper. So I'm particularly pleased to have with me INU's coordinator, Laura Boyot, who has been one of civil society's strongest voices on this issue. Laura, this declaration is, of course, negotiated and endorsed by countries. What was and is the role of civil society in the process leading to its adoption? Well, civil society has been very actively engaged on this issue for more than a decade now. So for a number of years leading up to the political declaration process. And I think a lot of our work, especially in the beginning, was about getting this issue onto the agenda, both internationally, but also nationally um, in our conversations with, with states, and really making the case that this required urgent attention. So in the early days in particular, our work was centered around documenting the impact of bombing and shelling on people and on civilians in particular, and of the consequences that this has on, on, on cities, cities being torn apart and showing what the problem is. So a lot of that involved doing research um, and data collection and communicating about the impacts. And I think, you know, sadly, over this period of time, we've seen countless examples of harm to civilians. We see it today in, in Ukraine, in Sudan, Ethiopia, Myanmar, but we're also seeing it in, in Yemen, Syria, Iraq, and a number of places uh, across this period of time. And what we see is that whenever towns and cities are bombed, it is civilians that suffer the most. And, and so we've, we've found this to be very much a pattern of harm. The context and the situations may change, uh, but it's predictable. And, and we see very similar effects in different places. So in the early years, our coalition and our members worked predominantly to make the case of why this issue required urgent attention. And, you know, in that period of time, the uptake from states wasn't immediate we were arguing that this isn't just an inevitable consequence of warfare, that when heavy explosive weapons are used, and we're talking here about um, aircraft bombs, rockets, artillery, weapons that have no place in, in town centres, and that they're a very risky choice because of their wide area effects. Um, and if they're used, they're likely to cause harm. So making the case, it's a very predictable pattern of harm and it needs to stop. And why does it matter to have civil society actively engaged? Over the past few years, we've been very closely involved in the consultations around the political declaration, both in terms of providing input to the text, 
so that it recognizes and describes the humanitarian impacts and that it guides actions to address these impacts in a variety of ways, including by by placing limitations on the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. But we've also been very involved as well in encouraging a broad range of states to be active in these discussions and making it the case that this is an issue that's of global concern, something that all states should be caring about. And I think I'd add just another thing that we try to do throughout this process and that we'll continue to do throughout the implementation phase. And I think this is a particular area where civil society organisations have a real added value and why our engagement is so vital. And that is that we try and bring the lived experiences to the forefront in policy making. So by engaging survivors um, and by by case studies and other work on, you know, demonstrating actual experiences of this on on people. Um, and we'll continue to do that through our explosive weapons monitoring project. We will continue to undertake research on civilian harm, um, but we'll also be monitoring implementation of the declaration and the changes that it's being that's being brought about. Many thanks, Laura, and I'm sure we'll be hearing lots from you going forward. So next with me, I have Dr. Irene Giorgio, who is a legal advisor at the Arms and Conduct of Hostilities Unit of the ICRC and who will specifically help me look at the legal and policy perspectives. Irene, one of the questions that keeps getting brought up is what does the declaration actually commit endorsing states to? And what would you say are the three key points? And how does the declaration relate or fit into the international humanitarian law framework? Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, great questions. Let me turn them a bit around and start by saying that, as the name suggests, of course, this is a political instrument, it's not a treaty, so it doesn't aim to create new law or to reinterpret IHL. It aims to facilitate respect for IHL and to strengthen the protection of civilians through policy commitments and practical measures. So that is essentially how it relates to international humanitarian law, which means that if properly implemented, it can contribute significantly to alleviating civilian suffering and to strengthening respect for the law. Now, as a recap, IHL does not prohibit the use of explosive weapons in populated areas as such, but the use of these weapons is, of course, regulated by the rules and principles that govern the conduct of facilities, like distinction, proportionality, and precautions. Now, because of their wide area impact, and consequently the high chance of causing indiscriminate effects, it is objectively very difficult to use heavy explosive weapons in populated areas in compliance with IHL. That's an important point to keep in mind. During the negotiations of the declaration, this law versus policy and the question of how the declaration relates to IHL was heavily discussed. And some states assured that they will only use explosive weapons in populated areas in a lawful manner, but it's far from clear what that means in practice. It's very unclear how states interpret and apply IHL when it comes to the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. And while compliance with the law is, of course, very important and needs to be strengthened, in particular in populated areas or urban areas uh, even more, the question is how to do this practically. And the answer is through policy. And indeed, militaries often implement the law through policy. And policy clarifies the meaning of legal obligations. Policy translates legal obligations into concrete and practical measures. And of course, for its recipients, for the commanders, for the staff of the armed forces, policy is binding. So here are three ways that I would highlight in which the political declaration concretely complements and supports the implementation of IHL through its three key policy commitments. First, um, and the most famous one, obviously states commit to restricting or refraining from the use of explosive weapons in populated areas where this use may be expected to cause civilian harm. And this is beyond doubt the core commitment of the declaration. Now, by curbing the use of heavy explosive weapons in populated areas in particular, states can significantly reduce the risk of civilian harm, but also the risk of committing a violation of IHL. And both 
IHL violations and civilian harm are very common results of the use of explosive weapons in populated areas, in particular heavy explosive weapons. Also, IHL requires parties to take all feasible precautions in attack to avoid or minimize civilian harm, including when choosing um, weapons and tactics. So this means they must restrict or refrain from using explosive weapons in populated areas, not only when this use would be indiscriminate or disproportionate, this would in any case be unlawful, but also every time it is feasible to restrict or refrain from such use and doing so would result in less civilian harm. The second key commitment, which also contributes to IHL compliance, is the commitment to take into account the um, indirect or as we call them reverberating effects of explosive weapons um, when planning and carrying out attacks, as long as these effects are reasonably foreseeable and also to conduct what is called battle damage assessments after an attack and to identify lessons learned from, from uh, attacks and military operations. Now, taking into account all reasonably foreseeable indirect effects that amount to civilian harm is in fact a legal requirement under, under IHL and the rule on proportionality. Um, and battle damage assessments and lessons learned exercises allow for allow the armed forces to better anticipate these effects in future attacks if they have documented them in the past and allow them to adapt their policy and practice accordingly. And this commitment is crucial in my view because the reverberating effects of explosive weapons in populated areas are often overlooked and are insufficiently considered when planning and executing attacks. However, they are a major source of suffering uh, for civilians, and this suffering is often long-term, especially when essential services like water, sanitation, electricity, healthcare are disrupted or even collapse as a result of bombing and shelling. And third key commitment, last one, is the commitment to collect and where possible to make public data on the direct and indirect effects on civilians of the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. And this is key uh, for many reasons, but linked to IHL critically because parties to conflict have an obligation to do everything possible to anticipate the effects of their attack. So the more we know about the effects of weapons and the harm they cause through collecting data on these effects, the more these effects will become reasonably foreseeable in the future and therefore avoiding or at least mitigating them in future attacks becomes more feasible. Last but absolutely crucial in a conversation on a declaration that seeks to address strengthening the protection of civilians from the humanitarian consequences arising from the use of EWIPA, I have with me Aurélien Buffler, Chief of the Policy Advice and Planning Section of the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, or short, OCHA. Aurélien, your office deals with humanitarian crises across the globe. How do you expect and hope that the declaration will make a difference for people living in conflict-affected areas? Thank you. Hi, uh, Juliana, and thank you for your question. Um, first, let me stress that the humanitarian needs have reached a, a whole-time high. Uh, so has the number of... Uh, displaced people by violence and conflict, uh, refugees and, uh, and, and IPs. And the use of explosive weapons in populated areas is actually a major cause for that situation. Uh, just think about Ukraine, Syria, Sudan, and other contexts. Uh, this is the cause of immense uh, human, humanitarian suffering. Uh, now, in context where parties to conflict have adopted some good practices and have decided to avoid the use of explosive weapons in populated areas, like in Afghanistan and Somalia, we've seen a very significant and rapid impact on the protection of civilians on the ground. The number of people killed and injured has dropped. Uh, so has the destruction of uh, schools, hospitals, uh, infrastructure like, uh, like water network or electrical grid. And do you expect the declaration to have a direct impact in the field today? So now the declaration integrates these policies and good practices 
uh, to prevent and respond more effectively to 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 humanitarian uh, suffering resulting from the use of uh, of EWIPA. So yes, I think if member states sign the declaration, remain true to their work, and I think they will. And if they take uh, rapid measures to integrate in their policies and doctrine and practices uh, provisions of the declaration, I think progress on the ground can be both uh, rapid and. Many thanks, Aurélien. So, having listened to our speakers, I think we can all agree that the finalization of this declaration and the success of the endorsement conference is, of course, a reason for celebration. But it also marks the beginning of a new phase of work. So, before concluding, I wanted to ask all of you what comes next. What is the number one thing that should happen to make this declaration a success story? First and foremost, I think it's important that we celebrate the declaration. It's important that we recognize that this declaration is already a success by its sheer existence, but it will make a significant difference only in when it is fully endorsed and that the commitments are implemented in good faith. Ultimately, I want to reiterate the appeal of the Secretary General that parties to conflict should employ strategies and tactics that take combat outside of populated areas with a view of ending urban fighting altogether. I think for now what we need to do is to maintain the momentum around it, get more countries on board, and I do think that we have, um, those of us who have been involved in this, and, and, and I say now, I, I refer to the 83, and indeed the UN institutions as well, or and agencies uh, with, uh, with civil society, to explain this text and to get more countries on board. Look, I think there's two areas uh, in which we need to work. Uh, first, implementation. It's very important that member states who sign the declaration take very concrete measures uh, to integrate the provisions of the declarations in their policies and, and practices and make sure that the forces on the ground actually implement uh, these policies and, and, and practices. And the UN and their partners uh, from the Red Cross, from the civil society will, of course, support them uh, in doing so. So implementation is one. Uh, second is really, we need to encourage a greater number of member states to join the effort and sign the declaration. I think that's very important. We have 83 states uh, so far. I think it's very significant, but I think we can do uh, better. I would add that we also need to engage in a dialogue with non-state armed groups who use explosive weapons in populated areas uh, to see with them uh, how they can limit human suffering resulting from the use of EWAP. I mean, we're not talking about them signing the declaration, but really I think this dialogue needs to happen uh, in different contexts. Um, also, the Oslo conference next year will be a key milestone, uh, and uh, we need to arrive in Oslo with very significant progress uh, to show. We want to see change, and I think crucially in the area of military policy and practice. And for this, it requires dialogue with different partners, armed forces, humanitarian operators, governments, civil society. This needs to be a collective process where we work together. I don't think one can do it without the other. I would say definitely a prompt and thorough revision of existing military policy and practice across all states that have endorsed this declaration to introduce practical measures to implement the commitments they have undertaken by means of this declaration. And this is the first and foremost central commitment and really the foundation of everything else. Reviewing, evaluating what exists, what is not appropriate and changing it. So let me just follow up with one quick question. In all of this, is there a way for listeners and especially for today's youth to get involved? Um, indeed, I think it's very important for young people to get in and engage. And I think there's uh, two, three very concrete things young people uh, can do. First, don't become numb to human suffering. I mean, it's very easy in the current uh, environment, in current society, where we're flooded with images to become numb uh, to what we see in Ukraine, Sudan, Syria, Somalia, or other contexts. But I think it's really important. We, we, we always keep in mind that there are real people under the bombs uh, and that it could be you or me is just 
pile up that we're not in the situation of these people. Uh, second, get engaged. Uh, many civil society, so, many civil society organizations like uh, Humanity and Inclusion, like uh, the International Network for Explosive Weapons, uh, develop petitions, develop activities uh, to sensitize the public uh, to the impact of explosive weapons uh, in populated areas. So, I mean, my only word to you is like uh, volunteer with them, get engaged with them. They're doing a fantastic job, and the United Nations, the country support uh, support this. And third, uh, hold your government accountable. Uh, if you government sign the declaration, ask your MPs what your government is actually doing for its implementation. Uh, what concrete steps have been taken by the armies, by the executive of the government to change policies and practices uh, on the ground? Um, certainly. One way is uh, through their local Red Cross and Red Crescent National Society. Uh, the entire movement of the Red Cross and Red Crescent is heavily engaged in advocating for governments to join the political declaration and to put in place a policy of avoiding the use of heavy explosive weapons in populated areas. So um, young generation in particular can get in touch with their local Red Cross, Red Crescent branch and um, get involved in their programs. And overall, I would say the tremendous civilian harm that we witness today should no longer be considered a normal byproduct of armed conflicts. And in this, we all, including the younger generation even more, we all have a role to play in changing this narrative. I think the involvement of young people will be particularly important. Um, young people can be working with our members in different countries, with their MPs, and helping to make sure that governments sign on to the declaration and they work to implement it. Many thanks to everyone that joined me today and, of course, to our listeners. Let's celebrate this milestone achievement. But importantly... Let's work towards universal adherence and meaningful implementation of this declaration to create a safer, more humane world together.